Lord, uh, give us a blessing here tonight. We open the word. We thank you for the book of Hebrews and all the potential that's here, Lord, of uh, learning deep and wonderful truths. So we always need your help, Lord, and we come to you uh, looking for the Holy Spirit to guide and lead us in this truth. Let us rightly divide the word of truth. We pray, Father, that uh, we will all become able ministers of that good word. Then, Lord, help us to share it wherever we go. And pray, Father, for more opportunities to do just that. We thank you, Lord, for uh, your tender mercies upon us and upon this nation. Uh, we pray, Father, that you continue to lead and guide us and bring revival to our times. Bless the offering now, we ask, Lord. We thank you for the good givers and for the faithfulness through all of this pandemic and thankful, Lord, that our bills are paid and uh, over seating abundantly above all that we could ask. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in the book of Hebrews, the second chapter, so I want you to turn to this, and uh, we've got some exciting truths to expound. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man, that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. 
For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is also able to succor them that are tempted. Well, we can just see from the reading of that text, we've got a lot to cover and a lot of uh, dynamic teaching. So God help us to do that. Well, we have to take heed or listen carefully uh, to the word. And that's how we begin giving earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. After all, Jesus said, He that hath ears, let him hear. So it's how we hear. It's the quality of our, our hearing. Uh, certainly anybody that has ears and left their deaf can hear. But uh, how do they receive that truth? And with what heart do they receive it? Are they listening with an earnestness and a sincerity to hear and to receive that truth? So that makes all the difference in the world. And of course, the warning here is thus, uh, less than any time we should let them slip. So here's that word, you know, it comes in and we, we process it, we hear it, we contemplate it, we walk out the door, we forget about it. James says it a little differently. It's like a man that beholds his face in a glass and by and by he leaves, you know, and uh, forgets what manner of man he is. So we, uh, we look into the glass, the Word of God, we hear the Scriptures, it, uh, it works on our heart, it brings conviction to our soul, and um, we're almost resolved to do something about what we heard, and then, well, the devil comes in, it, uh, rearranges our thinking, and it just somehow doesn't mean as much as it did just for that moment. It seemed to be a piercing truth. It seemed to be uh, in our heart to, we must do and act upon it. And what happens, but uh, uh, the service ends. Uh, we're outside, we uh, start engaging in conversation. Before too long, that moment is past, and the conviction with it is past. Amen. As it were, we let it slip. We let it slip. Ezekiel uh, speaks to this also in a, in a little different way as a prophet, of course, in a very troublesome time during the uh, pre-captivity and also during the captivity. So Ezekiel, along with Daniel, their prophets uh, and Jeremiah that are warning ahead of time and then, of course, going through the captivity, giving warning all the while. And in this case, uh, warnings that we might say unheeded. And his complaint here is in the 33rd chapter where he speaks of himself. He says, they came, came unto thee as the, peop, as the people cometh. So uh, they came to Ezekiel as people come. They assemble themselves and they sit before thee as my people, the Lord says. They hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art as unto them a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. So uh, this is a lamentation, as it were, in Ezekiel. Uh, he knows what's on the horizon here as far as the judgment is concerned. Jeremiah knew it as well, but uh, they speak these words and, uh, and it goes into the air. The people don't hear, they don't heed. 
They don't heed earnestly, certainly. They don't take it to heart. They do nothing about what they've heard. Oh, they acknowledge that the words are God's words. They acknowledge uh, the truth of them, but somehow they find, it finds no application in their heart. They become, as James calls them, forgetful hearers, not doers of the word. There are illustrations, uh, Acts chapter 7, Stephen, you'll recall, is converted. Perhaps he's one of the 3,000 at Pentecost that hears the preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Here's Peter uh, preaching, and uh, Stephen, I think at that point, probably converted. He's a young man, and uh, with youthful zeal, he begins uh, speaking the word out. And he has a single sermon, one sermon, and uh, they stone him to death. Now, you remember it in Acts chapter 7. And so he, or Stephen, uh, said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. So here the people came. They heard what he was saying there. That entire seventh chapter is a discourse about the history of the Jewish people and the faithfulness of God to those people. And what but happens that uh, he's so rejected that they stop up their ears because he uh, has the temerity to bring up Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection and actually lays the axe to the root that they're the cause of his death. And uh, that would be enough for them. They rush upon him, ears stopped up, gnawing upon his flesh even. And at that point, uh, the heavens open. And the, he sees the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And that was the end of Stephen's uh, first, his first and his uh, last sermon on earth. But um, he hardly felt a stone coming upon him. He's looking up to heaven. He sees heaven opened. Imagine this and God uh, and Jesus seated at the right hand, standing at the right hand of God. So all of this, of course, is uh, what the believers have in store for them, especially in the case of the martyr's crown. Now we'll look at Jeremiah, who I've already mentioned uh, also. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Uh, I mean, what a shame this is indeed. Now here in this country, it's a, we have a glut. Uh, the word of God is everywhere. You can't avoid it. It's on radio, or television, it's in printed form. Uh, you can hear it uh, preached in, in churches, uh, uh, just thousands and thousands of churches in America. So. All of this, uh, like I said, there's a glut. Everywhere you go, there's much of the Word of God available for people. So, uh, and yet, we, we all have Bibles. Everybody has a Bible. Who's reading it and, and who's understanding it, if you want to even go further than that? So, uh, that was Jeremiah's lamentation, likewise, in his day. So like, uh, like Ezekiel, they come before him. They heard Jeremiah. Of course, uh, they brought persecution upon him. He wasn't bringing a popular message after all. He was predicting the judgment and fall of Jerusalem, and the, and the king ordered his uh, uh, imprisonment as a result. And uh, so it was to them a reproach. They didn't like the negativity of the message, and so that's, uh, that's how they responded. Uh, here's James. I was hoping we'd get to that. James 1.22. So uh, he says, Be doers, not hearers, deceiving your own selves. For if any man hear, be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding himself, uh, his natural face in the glass. The glass is the mirror he's talking about here. I put up a couple funny pictures, I suppose, here, because, you know, we all have a self-image, and then and then that's destroyed when you look in the mirror, right? Because, you, wow, you know, you didn't realize you were looking that old. They had that many wrinkles instead of two chins, now three. You know what I mean? Bellies hanging out and all this acne if you're a young person, you know. Uh, the mirror tells the story, doesn't it? Mirror, mirror on the wall. You know, it'll tell you, you're the ugliest of them all. So you don't have a... And, and the Bible is a mirror because as you read it, you're reading about yourselves, aren't you? So a missionary that uh, had gone in amongst the uh, people, he hadn't learned their language enough, but he still had a zeal, and he felt uh, he preached uh, the gospel as he knew it in the English. But, of course, nobody knew what he was saying. It would take several years for him to master the language. 
But he'd still go ahead and he'd preach uh, about the, the best he could and he'd put together the words that he could and so forth. And finally he mastered the language and he would go out with his little black book, the Bible, you know, and he'd go from village to village and he'd preach the Word of God and, uh, in their native tongue. And uh, some of the villagers came to him insulted and said, how could you all these years you came to us and you had that little black book and you were writing down all of our evil deeds in that black book and, and now you're telling the whole world in our language what those deeds were. Shame on you. Well, he tried to explain. It, this was the way that the Bible operates. It brings conviction immediately and it names sin. And uh, it, it is a glass. If we look at it, we'll find ourselves in it. Romans chapter 3 uh, so, as it is written, none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way together, become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues. They have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouths are filled with cursing and bitterness. It goes on there through that third chapter. You've got to understand, you're reading about yourself. It's a biography. And uh, we don't leave it. Of course, there's salvation at the end of all of that. After, after we find condemnation for sin, there's also something to do about it. So he's, uh, James says he beholds himself. He goes his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. And uh, whoso looketh unto the perfect law of liberty. That's just another way of describing the scriptures. The perfect law of liberty. Well, the two are almost oxymoronic, or uh, at least in some kind of uh, Antigone. What, what are we talking about here? Law on one side and liberty on the other. So law and liberty. Uh, so I've, uh, I've found the perfect law of liberty is the law of Christ. Christ in us is the royal law that James speaks about. And that's, that's a fulfilled law and righteousness that has been imputed to us and now lives happily in our heart. And as we battle with the old nature, we become liberated from uh, the old uh, habits of the world. Thank God. So he looks into the perfect law of liberty, continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man is blessed in his deed. So James is telling us, in contrast, those that look in the Bible, they hear it for a little season. Je, uh, Jesus spoke in Luke 8 in particular. Uh, you have it in Matthew 13 and repeated in Luke 8. But the idea of the sower goes out and he sows the seed. And uh, some seed falls upon stony ground and anon it brings forth. But then because it has no root, it withers. So uh, it, 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 it's on stony ground. So it can't take rooting. When Jesus later explained it, he said, these are those that hear and for a while believe. Now you can look at that and figure it out now. It's pretty simple. People act like they're believing. I've been fooled many times, haven't you? I've probably baptized a number of them. But they said they believed. How would I know if they are or they aren't believing? I Thank God that's not my business to figure out. Uh, but you can see from the scriptures that there are people that believe for a while. And then by and by they're offended. Big persecution arises because of the word and by and by they're offended. So, so Jesus is giving us the illustration of those that believe for a little while. Or as we have here in Hebrews 2, they hear but not necessarily with sincerity or earnestly. They're not, and, and they're not clinging to the word or holding fast the word. They let it slip. In other words, it has no effect. Or as James says it, in just a little different way, they behold their face in the glass. They agree that they're seeing their, themselves, that the Scripture speaks to their needs. But they, they somehow forget. They become forgetful hearers. And they don't act upon what they have heard. It's, they're in a lost condition. As we go through the book of Hebrews, this will be pointed out time and again. Because the great issue, the central issue of this seminal work of the Apostle Paul has to be the fact that he was dealing with people that were halfway converted. Halfway converted. Now, of course, Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. There's no such thing as halfway conversion. What I mean by that is that just like the children of Israel, they got right up to the promised land. They tasted of the fruits, uh, the grapes of Eshkel. They, uh, they, they knew that God had opened the Red Sea before them. This God could do anything, but they wouldn't go into the promised land. 
So they came up short, and this will come up in the third chapter, fourth chapter, you'll see it in the tenth chapter, sixth chapter, all of these chapters of Hebrews seems, to, again, this central theme has to be the fact that they came up short. And it's seen here in the second chapter about those that hear the word and they let it slip. They don't act upon it. Uh, so, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So uh, you hear the word and the very essence of faith itself is created by the hearing of that word. That's why, why, that's why it's so hard to get people to church because after all, the devil knows what will happen if they get here. You see, because it, 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 there's a sense in which I don't know how many people tell me this. Just got a text, uh, a fellow here at church on Sunday. And uh, I don't know how many years now been hoping and ministering and uh, to him, I'm glad he was here, of course. But he said, you know, I, I, I want to be baptized, but I, I, I don't think I'm ready. So what does that tell me? He's holding on to something, right? At least he understands. You see, I, I'm not as concerned about it. I'm concerned about the people that say, oh, yeah, I believe all that. You know, and they just take it. It's very light to them. And I'd far rather have somebody that's really considering this, as Jesus said, that they count the cost. If they want to become a Christian or not, they need to understand that this is a changed lifestyle. And, and we, draw, we draw the line to let people know, not that that's going to save you by giving up your drink and your drugs and your women and all this sort of thing. What's, what's important for you to understand is that Christ in you, if you mean this, is going to clear that junk out of your life. Uh, because it's a contradiction to the Christian life. Uh, so, at any rate, so Proverbs twenty two seventeen, bow down thine ear, hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. So when Jesus said, he that hath ears, he means, can you hear me with your heart, to believe it with your heart? Amen. Well, look, there's that chapter. I, if I'd have waited long enough, it would have come up, right? So there it is. Luke 8:18. 8, it's the it's the uh, sowing of the seed. Take heed therefore how ye hear for whosoever hath to him shall be given and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. Now that comes right after the text I told you about the the sower that goes out to sow seed. Some falls on the wayside, some falls on the stony ground, some falls on the thorny ground, but the good seed, right? The seed that falls on the good ground, it brings forth, not all in the same abundance, but some 20, some 60, some 100 fold. So, uh, and then right after this, after Jesus is done giving the parable, as it were, it gives the explanation of the parable, which is this 18th verse. Take heed how you hear. One thing to hear, it's quite another thing to hear, earnestly hear. Quite another thing to hear the word and then let those words slip. Uh, and another thing then, to hold fast the form of sound words. So, lest at any time you should let them slip. So, uh, how could this happen, you would wonder, right? Let the Word of God slip out of your grip. So, um, <clears throat> here's some passages that will help us with this concept then. Uh, it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So the idea of uh, holding it fast, it's like there's, uh, this is obligatory. If a believer is going to hear the word, he must hold it. It's one thing to hear it, it's another thing to say, it's now it's mine, I possess it. It's, I, I'm going to take that in. Uh, so, so how valuable it is to memorize it and to know it then, because you know there might come a time, who, who knows, with the crazy uh, people that we have in our country, we have some crazy people. I mean, really, they talk about defunding the police. Are you out of your minds? But we have people like this that think somehow, you know, that it's a terrible society and we've got to change it. They're Marxists. And they're talking about a revolution. You know, uh, you know what? They'd be the first ones that will be executed if the Marxists actually take over. I mean, they, this is what happens. The media, all those, uh, those smart Alex, the multimillionaire crybabies on, uh, you know, David Muir and uh, who else is on now? I mean, they, uh, all the talking heads and so forth. Uh, they, they're the first ones that will get slaughtered. Amen. Because the free press, the free media, oh, that won't be, a, that's not allowed in communism. But we don't understand, uh, it's, it's insanity all about us and so on. Uh, but we've got, a, we've got a, a more sure word of prophecy, we hold on to it, we hold fast to it. 
and uh, and how it changes the life it changes the perspective it'll give you a completely different idea ideology about everything including uh, governments th and how they reign and what they're about and so forth uh, how we treat our fellow men you know the compassion that's so lacking in our generation in our society true christian love uh, when it when we're inebriated with that love we, we want to do what we can we want to see what we can do to to rescue the perishing and bring people out of the trouble uh, even in their temporal distresses that's that's what christianity's about Amen. so it produces this this fruit in the in the heart so we hold fast that which is good and we despise that which is evil that's the nature of Christ second Timothy 1 13 so he says hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard uh, of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus again to Titus remember now what we've got here in these these are called pastoral epistles first second Timothy and Titus they're pastoral epistles it is Timothy, uh, it's Paul speaking to young Timothy, passing the baton. Paul is at the end of his life. Uh, he knows he's about to be executed for preaching the gospel. Nero's sword hangs uh, by uh, uh, the Damoclean thread, so to speak, over his neck. At any moment, he could be called in for execution. So he uh, hurriedly writes these letters and gives instruction to the next generation, uh, lest they somehow compromise that word and and that they need to hold it and hold it fast hold fast the form of uh, hold fast the faithful words as as you have been taught uh, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers first timothy 6 12 fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life you know, again, you're saying, what is this about laying hold on it? As though, but as though it depended on you to keep yourself saved. How's that sound? Like Jude says, keep yourselves in the Holy Ghost. What do, how do you keep yourself? Well, as much as lies within you, you hold fast the scripture. Now, God will do his part. But uh, you see, there's certain, it's obligatory. The believers now, uh, we don't just sit back, rest, rest and relax. We're, we've got to be in constant mode of study and understanding and keeping the word and living the word that we, that we know. We know it's the truth. And so we have to live by that word. So lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. So we want to be able to give out the word and uh, it, we can't do that if we don't have it. Uh, so I gave some warnings, what, two weeks ago or whatever on our studies of the two-edged sword about translations. And uh, I mean, people uh, simplistically uh, look at it and say, well, what's the difference? You know, it's the Bible one way or the other. What's the difference? Uh, I could say that and still be using the Catholic uh, douay Rheims version. You know, what's the difference? Uh, there's a difference. And uh, I guess to the neophyte, to the, the new believer, there is no difference. They don't, they don't discern the difference. They don't know what has been taken out. But you know, I, I make the complaint often. How many of you remember as a child eating Oreo cookies? I do. And the white filling was so thick in them, right? Now what happened is they began reducing it little by little. You, and you're not even aware. Now it's a paintbrush that they put on it and put it, unless you want to buy the double stuff. The double stuff is still smaller than what it was when I was a, a child, I'm telling you. Uh, but uh, they play with your head, don't they? So they take something out. They're taking something out. And, and when something's missing, well, if you have good spiritual taste buds, you begin to recognize, hey, something, something's corrupt here. Amen. And that's what the devil's all about, corrupting the Word of God best he can. Of course, at this point, just getting people to read it is difficult. But, um, and that's why folks say, well, we've got to give them something that they can understand. Because the public education system has failed in teaching people how to read. That's for certain, you know. So what are we going to do about it? Well, they teach them how to read, I suppose, right? We all have to learn that somewhere. All right, so we got First Timothy here again. How many places now in these pastoral epistles? Uh, there's an urgency about what Paul's writing, apparently, because people were letting that word slip. So holding fast uh, faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So it's all about holding 
the good thing and holding it fast. Even in the Old Testament, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou uh, have good success. So Proverbs 3. So we have the, um, the, even in the Old Testament, the notion and concept of holding the words. That good thing which was commanded unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. All right, so we'll move on here to the second verse. If the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, I'm just going to take that portion of the phrase, this independent clause, uh, and we'll get into the rest of it because it all fits together. Again, when people argue about the authorship of the book of Hebrews, I, all you have to do is read just a few lines and uh, you're already aware of the convoluted writing style of the Apostle Paul. To me, there's, there's really no doubt about it. Uh, and certainly this, this is a context that would bear that out where you're going three and four and five verses before you end the sentence. It's the way of Paul's writing. Even Peter notes, uh, which uh, writing the, uh, reading the Apostle Paul, he said uh, things which are hard to be understood. So, <laughs> All right, so he speaks of this notion. And uh, so if the word spoken by angels was steadfast. Now, now, we understand the word malach uh, uh, in the Old Testament, and that is a messenger. And so, really, the word angel here, even in the New Testament, angelus, so we have the notion of a messenger. So, are we always speaking about a divine messenger? In this context, yes. I'm not sure in the book of Revelation when... Uh, the seven churches, you know, that the message is given to the seven angels of the seven churches. If there we're talking about angels in the spiritual realm, or if we're talking about the messengers of the seven churches, which would be the ministers of those churches or the pastors of those churches. If so, it's the only place that people refer to their pastor as an angel at any rate. So we have this word that was spoken at Sinai. So uh, we have to go back in the Old Testament and realize that when the law was given out on Mount Sinai, of course I've got here uh, this picture that I've kind of uh, a composition of images that I put together intentionally so that you realize it was a frightening experience and the children of Israel are in the valley below and they're seeing, uh, one would have to say, a, 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 just a an imposing figure, Mount Sinai itself certainly, but it's on fire. The top of it is on fire. There is a cloud not described uh, in, in the scripture completely, but I would assume it to be the Shekinah of God. A cloud comes down and, and uh, envelops the top of the mountain. Voices are heard coming out of the mountain. Trumpet sounds, lightning bolts, uh, earthquakes. So what is this all about? Well, we'll go back to Deuteronomy here, 33rd chapter. And uh, we see the angels here in the disposition of the law, or the dispersion of the law. And he said, the Lord uh, came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Parn, and he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand and went, and went a fiery law for them. So, now we're the understanding this expression, again, who are the saints? Uh, we had a little study on this in Sunday school, on Sunday. But the, the notion of the saints, who are these saints anyway? Uh, well, they're the holy ones. They're the sanctified ones. They certainly, it's a term that's applied to the angelic host. So they came at Sinai, apparently, uh, somewhat in, uh, in number. You see here thousands, tens of thousands. And they're all part of this dramatic scene that I'm talking about that, again, would have been hair-raising if you, if you were in the valley below watching all of this. The spectacle itself would be enough to make you tremble and fear for your life. With tens of thousands of angels filling up the atmosphere, with voices coming out, ominous voices, uh, all of this to demonstrate <clears throat> demonstrate the the purity of God's law, the perfection of God's law, the holiness of the God that we're dealing with here, 
This would put them and ought to put anybody in abject fear of the Lord, which is a right spirit to have towards him. He's about now to give out his law. He intends for people to respect it and to obey it. And when Moses comes down with that uh, law, he's giving it at the dispensation of angels. And that's what I think Hebrews is speaking about here when it speaks about the angels here uh, giving out that word, it's the word spoken by angels. We also see in Galatians 3, wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Of course, the mediator is Moses. Uh, but you see here again that angels played a part in the dispersion uh, of this word, of, of bringing it to us. There's more than Ten Commandments. Now, we all understand this. So we have at least the Decalogue written in stone, but there's much more to it than that. When Moses comes down, there's much more to relate to those that are in the valley. Uh, you'll have the next 10 chapters of the book of Exodus, 20 to 30, to comprehend everything that God had in mind in the giving and the uh, dispensation of the law. Angels were part of that expression. And Moses now being the mediator between the sinful people in the valley and these angelic beings that are called saints in glory. So hopefully that clears up a verse that uh, causes some deal of uh, controversy. So uh, we want to keep all of this in mind. So let's go back, though, third verse where it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Uh, so there's the idea, uh, kind of the central uh, concept of this, this particular chapter. So I want to spend, I guess, the rest of the night on this for whatever is left of it. So, <clears throat> so how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So here you'll preach the word out, and uh, it's commonly rejected, probably. You'll notice on Sunday morning I preached uh, some salvation message. For good reason, I had unsaved people here. Um, and in the last year and a half, how many unsaved have I really had here? But uh, I was glad for the opportunity. So, of course, uh, you folks probably know right away when I move in that uh, direction to start praying. There must be somebody here to be reached. Uh, so we give out that plan, uh, unashamedly repeated uh, how many times, hundreds of times over the uh, course of a few uh, years. So <clears throat> that's so valuable that they understand how to be saved. So great a salvation that they would know it and that they would believe it. <clears throat> the problem, of course, in again, there are people that, uh, like James says, they'll they listen to it. Or like Ezekiel said, they'll listen as though it's a, a pleasant voice that's heard. The, uh, you know, and they'll acknowledge it to some degree. But it has no effect. I would imagine for most people listening to the word. Now there are some people that can pretend like they're bored with it. But really, I've said this, I, I, hope, I, I hope I'm true about this. I think that would not, not be the way to describe my delivery. It's not boring. It could be other things, but it's not boring. It could be irritating, that I understand. It can be convicting, that I understand. Boring, it's not really boring. Uh, it's compelling to, to a great degree. Whether they want to or not, they have to listen. And I'm not giving myself credit. That's what I believe the Holy Ghost does with these opportunities. I don't know how many funerals I preach with the unsaved present. I can tell as I look around the room, there are people that are already kind of figuring, oh, well, you know, it's one of these, you know, you just kind of endure it and you go through it. And until I start speaking, then I'm noticing, I'm noticing a reaction, almost a physical reaction to what I'm saying. I can tell if somebody doesn't want to hear it. I can tell if there are people that it's something they haven't, they haven't heard this before. It's something that's new in a sense. Now, how shall they escape the damnation of hell if they've been exposed to that truth, that it has been made that plain. I had a text from somebody from last week also that said that was as plain as it could be. And the, oh, I hope so. It better be plain. So 
what happens to the person then that says, not now? Uh, who says in his heart, you know what? I've got to hear this again. You know, like uh, Felix and Drusilla. Uh, we, we shall hear you again on this. You know, that was just temporizing. That's all he was doing. He's putting the matter off because he's feeling a conviction. And if this goes on, he might do something about it. And the devil knows it too, by the way. And that's why interruptions have to come. And people have to do things some, sometimes. Even believers get in the way. And uh, remember... Jesus has that woman right on the hook, right, the woman at the well. And he knows, she no sooner wants to know more, and the disciples come bumbling in, right? Hey, you haven't eaten anything, you know. What are you doing here with this woman here at the well? And she runs away at that point, you know. Uh, how inauspicious of them. But uh, I'm afraid even believers sometimes are used of the devil to cause stumbling blocks along the pattern. Um, this is uh, taken from a devotion that I wrote a while back. I called it the straightway course. Straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Mark chapter 1 verse 18. So the temporizing spirit of the, act, of the Adamic nature is all too willing to defer to a, quote, more convenient season. How evanescent is that moment of inspiration that quickens the soul with divine urgings. If we do not act decisively, that moment will so rapidly dissipate. Desire must be met with resolution, and resolution with action. The love of many will, quote, wax cold, and so it is best to act while the heart is hot. The Roman poet Horace coined the aphorism, carpe diem, seize the day. The opportunity may never present itself ever again. Bartimaeus knew he had but one moment to beg for his petition. He forcefully, obtrusively cried out, and his plea was received and duly rewarded. The kingdom of God is taken by violence, not inertia. How many intentions are left withering on the vine of inactivity? What for the moment was a fervent resolution so soon degrades to a task best left to another time? The thought may come at an inopportune time, but there is no mistaking that the call is from the Lord. Some kind act of, or thoughtful word needs to be discharged. Go at once, for the king's business requires haste. By tomorrow, the prompting may not strike your heart with the same urgency. There's a soul in eternal danger, and the Lord has given you the burden. Discharge the commission post-haste, for the next week may bring an untimely death. There is the peculiar sense that some loved one is in need of protective prayer. Straightway to the closet. Offer up the needed intercession, though you may never ever learn the outcome of that petition until that eternal day of discovery. That old serpent, the devil, is the grand procrastinator. He populates the realm of the damned with the foolish who hear the master calling, follow me. But they, with one consent, begin to make excuse. How eternally vital it is to seek the Lord while he may be found and make a straight course to his receiving arms while it is called today. So, it's all about urgency. There's the passage I ended with. It's Isaiah 55, 6. It's all about acting while the Holy Spirit is doing the operation on the heart. Time and again, the scripture brings the matter up that we don't have forever after all that we are temporal beings. We're reminded all the time. One tunes into the news and hears of a person that dies. You know, the first thing that people, when I say, oh, so-and-so died, how old were they? They want to know right away. I said, oh, about your age. But you know, that knowing the time, that now it is high time. High time means it's, it's high time to act, right? High time to awake out of sleep, for now is your salvation nearer than when we believed the night is far spent, the day is at hand. <clears throat> let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. 
in Romans 13. It's all about do it and do it now while the Spirit is present. The shepherds made a long journey, but they came, notice, with haste. They came with haste. They didn't want to miss this grand ceremony. They wanted to be there at the birth. Expositors, probably uh, very wise men, but they like the, to look at the word there, uh, the young child in Matthew. And they like to point and say, uh, the, shepherds, uh, the shepherds came the night of his birth, but the wise men came two years after because of the word young child. Um, pedantic study of the scripture uh, makes one dull, I think. Listen, these people were astrologers. They looked up to the heavens and they were studying. I could call them astronomers for that matter. And they thought there was a message out there. And I think they had good reason to believe that God had placed a message out there. And when they saw that Nova, they had never seen anything like this before. And they made haste. They said something important has just happened. And so they made haste. And they knew what it, it, it was. Uh, they had searched the scriptures of Daniel. Uh, perhaps they understood the chronology of Daniel chapter 9. I think they were waiting and looking for this to happen. And so when it happened, they were there. And they were there. So uh, I think uh, we'll keep the wise men right there at the crib, along with the shepherds and the camels and uh, the donkeys and everything else. That's, uh, it's a homely scene, but a beautiful one. So you do it with haste. They found the Lord. This uh, passage... Uh, of course, Paul is all about uh, uh, practical theology. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Um, so he said, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So the emphasis is on the word now. And just as you'll see a little bit later in the fourth chapter, today, uh, after so long a time, today, if you will hear his voice harden not your hearts. So, um, and then of course, Jeremiah, this wonderful passage, everybody knows the 11th verse, uh, that God has a, uh, a destiny and a plan for us, doesn't he? <laughs> I know the thoughts that I have towards thee, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring thee to the expected end. Then shall you call upon me and ye shall go and ye shall pray unto me and I will hearken unto thee and ye shall seek me and ye shall find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Amen. That's what the Lord's looking for, isn't it? Amen. So back to our text it says, so how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So, and what does he mean by this? Well, of course, Matthew 23 when Jesus had to deal with the uh, Pharisees and the scribes, um, you can see here, he did not mince words, did he? He wasn't careful in parsing them to see, well, uh, you know, somebody might be offended if I say this. But no, no, he, he told them what the truth was. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Now we know, again, what this escape is all about. How shall we escape? And we can almost say that there's like an ellipsis here, that we're missing something. What's, how shall we escape what? We're wondering, right? In other words, the truth is so obvious that it doesn't need to be stated. What shall you escape? How shall ye escape? Escape what, you might say? Well, Jesus fills in the blank if you'd like to know. How shall you escape the damnation of hell? Hard words, harsh words, one might say. Who was I accused of? Oh, just a little while ago, being harsh and so forth. And I said, boy, you know, I don't know how people would have lasted a hundred years ago at the preaching that went on a hundred years ago. Um, we're such a soft generation, right? Harsh. <laughs> well, uh, you know what? These are harsh words. There's no doubt about it. And one reads them and should tremble at the hearing of them, as a matter of fact. Amen. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. Amen. There is a damnation of hell. And these religionists, people that had, they did not expect that that's what would happen to them. And there they shall be cast down into the lowest pits. You're a generation of vipers, he called them. 
how shall ye escape the damnation of hell? Now one could say, he's speaking rhetorically, how shall ye escape the damnation of hell? But if you put a question mark at the end of that, if Jesus in fact was, was saying, well, how, how can you do this? Perhaps he's enticing them to seek a way of escape. To think, if somebody should say that to you, it sounds like the, the matter is already settled. How shall you escape? There's no escape for me. But it's, it, imposing it in this fashion, how shall you escape? It, we ponder, well, how, how will we escape? How, how can we escape? Their answer would be because uh, we're good keepers of the law. We are, after all, Pharisees. The word itself means law keepers. Uh, so they'd answer that question. That's how we'll escape the damnation of hell. But perhaps uh, one like Nicodemus was in the crowd and heard those words and, and maybe shuddered a bit when he thought of it. Uh, people aren't really that self-assured. None of us would be self-assured if it were not for the fact that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Other than that, what confidence can we have in ourselves? Uh, if we're just trusting how good we were, we'd always be wondering if we're really going to be good enough to, to make it to heaven, which is mostly the answer that the lost give. Well, I, I think, you know, I'm, I think I'm a good person. I think I can make it. I think, it'll, I think I've done enough. That's, that's how they look at it. But how else do you answer the question? How shall you escape the damnation of hell? Well, thank God that we know the answer to that, that we do have an escape plan, that God has made it possible. I probably should have brought it with me, and maybe will next week, is the testimony of the, the two fellows that escaped 9-11 uh, in the buildings, uh, in the towers. And uh, the guy that gave the testimony was in his office looking out the window as the plane was headed right for his window. And uh, he ducks under a desk and somehow gets thrown across the room and is still alive. He smells the jet fuel. He, he can feel the heat. And, uh, but all this rubble is on top of him. His co-worker comes to his rescue and pulls things off and they become instant friends and uh, he said Fo follow me he said we'll go down the stairwell there was only one stairwell that would have led to safety all the other st stairwells that people went down they perished uh, because of the collapse fire smoke inhalation all the rest there was only one stairwell that would lead to safety and some 20 some people found their way out and that stairwell. Amazing, miraculous, you'd have to say. But I use it as an illustration. I mean, there is only one way out, the only one escape Amen. from a fiery inferno. And you know, of course, both uh, the, the one man that did the saving was a Christian. The other man that was saved physically became saved spiritually. And they give testimony. Everybody remember my giving it here? I mean, that, that, was, that was a powerful testimony. But it, sometimes it takes an event like that where you're brought face to face with your own uh, terminus. And if only we understood how fragile the equation is that every one of us here is a terminal patient. We're all, we're all uh, there's a time on us and an expiration date. <laughs> how shall you escape? Uh, and so thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which, I, uh, which do such things, doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Now this indeed is a rhetorical question. In other words, even though the question marks applied, it's a statement. You can't escape if you're that much of a hypocrite, is what which, uh, the Apostle Paul is saying in the book of Romans. So do you, do you think that you judge others and then you're doing the very same thing? Pharisees were noted for this, as a matter of fact. Finding the fault in others, but not in themselves. Another place in 1 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians, or no, 1 Thessalonians 5. So when they sh uh, shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now he's talking here eschatologically of the end of the world. He's talking about the coming of Antichrist. Antichrist comes with a policy of peace. Just finished uh, Daniel this morning and uh, you know the Antichrist is seen there in several personages. But uh, what's, it's, uh, he has a policy of peace and in it he prospers. 
and the Antichrist uh, will come into the world just like our, well, you know, we're all getting set up for this because all these candidates come up. What do they say? Every hope, hope and change. Vote for me. It's going to be changed. We're going to have peace on earth. Everything and so forth. There's going to be a chicken in every pot. You know, now everybody's going to get a job and we're all going to give free uh, this, free that. And everybody going to get free. And people love it. They vote for him. And then, of course, uh, in about six months, they, ah, you're another liar. That's all you are. But Antichrist will carry it out. There will be peace on earth. And that will be shocking to most people. They've been waiting for the superhero to finally arrive. And he did. And he kept his word. And there's peace on earth. And uh, prosperity. You can see uh, how, how many people are so willing then to follow the beast. So peace and safety, they'll say. Then what sudden destruction in the midst of the seven years, the three and a half years of prosperity, then tribulation so great that the world has never seen. But it says here, they shall not escape. So here they are marked for damnation. Uh, they've followed the devil and they've worshipped the living devil, the Antichrist. Jeremiah also refers to this uh, somewhat... Um, Obscure text, therefore thus saith the Lord, behold, <clears throat> I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. This is disobedient Israel. Jeremiah was sent to them and came, you know, remember with the yoke, the wooden yoke. And uh, Pasher, the false prophet, said, don't listen to this man. He's, tra he's trying to scare everybody. He's telling everybody that, the, that Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, that the, the king of Babylon's coming down. We, we all know that we, we have a peace contract with him, and we have Egypt to back us up, and we're going to be okay. And, and uh, the king liked hearing that message, didn't like Jeremiah's message, so put him in the dungeon and get rid of him, right? But uh, nonetheless, he was a faithful word, and he said, listen, you're not going to escape the judgment that's coming. And they didn't escape, did they? They were brought under terrible bondage, three fearful visits, and finally Nebuchadnezzar drags them away, destroys their temple, and brings them captivity to uh, Babylon. So, and of course, Proverbs 19.5 says, The false witness, the liar, shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Uh, also, you're going to find it here in uh, Hebrews 12, 25. See that uh, ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused uh, him that spake on earth, how much uh, shall, more shall they not, uh, shall they not uh, we escape uh, if, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? So we have uh, uh, something that we'll be looking at in much closer detail when we get to the 12th chapter, but it certainly relates to what we see now about this escape and the notion of escaping. Well, we know what the escape plan is. We were, uh, what were we other than brands uh, that Christ has come to pluck from the burning? So he says, deliver me in thy righteousness, cause me to escape. People ask me, well, where's the sinner's prayer found in the Bible? I said, everywhere. <laughs> Try this one. This one will work. Right? Deliver me in thy righteousness. Cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. That'll, that'll do. 2 Peter 1, 4, whereby are given unto thee exceeding great precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature and of his having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So great a salvation. But this expression we have to save for next Wednesday. Father, uh, be pleased with what we have taught and grant to us now an ability to uh, learn from it. Let us leave here, Lord, better having been here, matured as believers and understanding your word even better than ever. Uh, help us to be not forgetful hearers, but doers of it. If there's something that struck us this night, that we will decidedly act upon what we have heard. Let us be doers, not hearers only. And we thank you for our Savior, who is indeed the escape plan. And we're glad that we found that. And there are those that accuse us as pre-tribulation rapturists as being escapists. Oh, how glad we are that we shall escape the wrath to come, that you have not appointed us to that day of wrath. Uh, we thank you for everything that that salvation has meant to us and will continue to mean to us for the many days that we're here on this earth. So blessed we pray tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. 
And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation.